Hello guys and dolls, welcome back to Honey Badger 3D Print and Paint. Today we're at Formnext in Germany. We're taking a look at some of the latest and greatest tech in 3D printing. We're talking with some new partners, some old partners, and we're going to chop this up into lots of different videos so that we can try to cover as much as humanly possible. But first of all, let's play a game of jacket, no jacket, because sometimes I'm going to be hot and sometimes I'm not. And it's going to make it really difficult from an editing perspective. <laughs> Let's get in there. Hello guys and dolls, we are at the Cubicon and AMR Europe group and I am here with Kez and we are talking about everything Cubicon and AMR. So talk to me a little bit about who Cubicon are to begin with because they're not a brand that a lot of people have heard of. No, exactly, but uh, Cubicon uh, exists for a long time. They were manufacturer, for instance, for uh, uh, Apple and Samsung for their uh, camera parts and they used 3D printing internally and uh, later they thought, okay, hey, that's a, it's a nice printer, perhaps we can sell them. And that's why they started to producing uh, their so printers. Started out as a printing as a service, moved into their machine, their machine lineup, which which has culminated in this. We'll talk yeah. about this in a second. But tell yeah. us a little bit about AMR as well. well AMR Europe is um, uh, founded in 2013, and uh, dealing with several uh, uh, 3D printer uh, equipment. I'm in this kind of business for more than 18 years. I'm one of the founders of uh, AMR Europe. Right. And we, uh, well, I think in 2012, we started already with uh, Cubicon. Right. Yeah. And that brings us on to the Dio, 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 Dio yeah. Dual Plus. Yeah. The Dio. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, he's better. <laughs> the Dual, Dual Plus. Plus yeah. Right. It's so this is, this is your, this is your renaissance painting of a, of a printer, right? This is, this is your flagship model. It, it looks is. incredibly cool. It's, it's insanely hot. Like yeah. I'm getting a tan just sitting next to it. Um, so talk a little bit about what's the special source here. What's, what's the features? What's makes this special? Yeah, the special feature, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a huge build platform, 300 by 300 by 300. It's, it's printing uh, pretty fast. It's uh, water cooled um, as almost all the uh, Cubicon printers, when the print's finished, you can remove the part without any tooling. Right. So that's absolutely uh, safe. And it can print in a high temperature. We can print it uh, till 500 degrees. 500, 500 so, okay, degrees. so 500 on the hot end. What, yeah. Active chamber heating? Yep, exactly. Up to? Uh, well, no, it, it's, it's uh, 80, 80 degrees. Right. And the uh, build plate you can, uh, it's 120 degrees. So, okay, so peak. PA carbon fiber, yeah. um, PP. I mean, that's almost all almost, the materials almost we do everything have. Almost everything until yeah. you get to. I think eye gliders material will be about some of the only stuff that it can't do. And we're talking like we're talking like space materials that they use in like for like SpaceX and things like that. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not something they're necessarily printing on machines like this. But um, but I mean this is obviously a huge build volume. What kind of print speeds are you getting with this? Uh, the, the the movement of the of the print hat is 300 millimeters yep. per second, and it can print 200 uh, millimeters per second. So 200 millimeters a yep. second with so high temperature a, a, filaments. Yes, exactly. Is so okay. So so obviously so. There'll be some people who have things like uh, bamboo carbons and things like that, where you are printing at about 200 millimeters a second for PLA, PETG, and ABS. If you were to, try, I mean, so to be clear, you absolutely couldn't print high temperature materials yeah. on those machines anyway. But even if you could, normal peak prints at like 50 millimeters yeah, a it will second. Take you absolutely. A and then you still have to anneal the parts, and it's yeah. really, really difficult. And and we said 200 millimeters a second mm -hmm. on, on, on high temperature filaments. That's insanely fast. It is. And, and, and what's also special, uh, a problem with printing a peak is that in supporting material, you have to, most of the time, you have to remove it by hand. Yes. And uh, we do have supporting material, removable supporting material, together with printing with peak. Yeah. So 
Active chamber heating is also something that presents a number of really unique challenges. So when you're dealing with Core XY, which this machine yep. is, you're trying to, you, you have your stepper motors generally inside of the build volume, which is now effectively an oven. Um, <laughs> and yeah, stepper yeah. motors don't like being inside of ovens and they tend to melt or explode or whatever. Exactly, yeah. so, so water cooling them is yep. not a solution that a lot of people are doing. No, they are, exactly. they try to, yeah. they try to, remotely mount them outside of the heat zone mm. which creates huge problems with motor function and with and, and, and with and with torsion oh. stresses and all oh. sorts of other things so you're water cooling the motors in this to mean that you can keep that volume nice and tight which is what's giving you a lot of that a lot of that speed capability right? uh, yeah exactly yeah that's what's really. happening and, and most of the uh, nicer things is that when you look at the pricing yeah it's uh, 16,000 euros for such a system so Okay, so sixty thousand euros is gonna is gonna <laughs> sounds like a lot of money, and to a lot of people it is until you're talking at a commercial level yeah. when what you focus on is return on investment, right? Yeah. So it's it's how long do I have to own this thing before it pays for itself? It's, it's a tool, so you have work for have to have work it's, for it's it, that, and then it's it pays that back. Efficient workflow. It's being able to push things through it. You're paying sixty thousand pounds for this machine. Other machines would cost a significantly more and be significantly slower. So. Mm -hmm. You're buying this for sixty thousand instead of another machine for a hundred, and it's four times faster than the, yeah. <laughs> the one that's nearly twice the price. And so it's so it's not just that it's cheaper than most industrial grade machines like this. It's also that it's four, three, four times the workflow that you're getting through, mm -hmm. and you've got all that capability inside of really quite a condensed unit like exactly. normally yeah. machines that have a 300 by 300 that have active yeah, they, heating they are like, huge but, yeah. huge. Yeah. But, you're, but you're actually getting this into a place where it can almost still be called desktop because it's you know all right it's on a big plinth here but mm. like you, th th this could still be in a regular lab you know it, in it a can be and, and space. without smelling anything due to the fact there's a, a, a triple filter uh, inside right. so you don't smell anything even when you uh, print in the high tech materials. Brilliant. So, okay, so then we have the younger brothers to these. So we have the other machines, which we'll do a pan to in a moment. Um, and are these also, are the other machines in Cubicon's lineup also high temperature, or are these more traditional FDM machines? Yeah, they're, they're more, tra more traditional. Right, okay, fair yeah, enough. They can, can print a lot of uh, materials, but they can't print high tech materials like Peak or Ultim. Uh, so let's just have a quick talk about what we're looking at regarding why 3D printing is starting to become a viable option in manufacturing and how it can genuinely help companies when they're dealing with parts that are obsolete or, or incredibly hard to manufacture or incredibly hard to get now. So, okay, so what we're talking about now is a time where 3D printing has been retroactively applied. So, so uh, th there's a common misconception that if you have designed a part to be aluminium, it must always be yeah. aluminium, right? So, so w what we've got here is well, uh, let's let's talk about what we've got here. What have we got here? We ha uh, here we've got we've got a machine that can uh, easily fold papers uh, in a very neat way, uh, and these these part of equipment will come in a larger equipment for OC Canon, HP, yeah, uh, Konica Minolto, and so on. So uh, a big challenge with this is when you're dealing with third party parts. Um, it's incredibly difficult to get original manufacturers to certify or agree that the part that you made is up to their standards. They, they love to believe that their standards are completely unachievable by mm -hmm. anybody else and they've got some sort of magic pexies that go in and make everything cool. But what we've got here is a time where there were metal parts that were, yep. that were originally designed and built for this and you have got, that we've, what you've done here is you've managed to make them stronger, cheaper, and, and we can and, produce, and produce them significantly yeah. faster than they ever could with the metal parts. And you've achieved certification from the original manufacturer that the parts that you're providing meet their overarching service yeah, standards. Otherwise, you weren't allowed to do this. Exactly, uh, yeah. because again, when you're dealing with industrial machines, certainly when you're dealing with machines like this, they come with service wrappers. And part of that service wrapper has a really big paragraph in it about, <laughs> about yeah. how you're not allowed to use anything, anything in yeah. it other than what they agree. And if yeah. you do, you void your contracts, you can void your lease, you can have penalty payments, all sorts uh -huh. of things. It's really savage. So, but so we have 83 parts now here in, and it's, it was allowed. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and, and that in and of itself, it, it, 
is astonishing because they are so protective over the over people coming in and, and making anything even remotely cheaper. Yeah. But you've managed to design, print, and and supply them at scale, and you're doing it for cheaper, and you're making engine you're making stronger parts from an engineering perspective yeah. than the original parts that were designed for the machine. Exactly. Yeah. That's what so really, is did. that is that a service that AMR offer? Regularly, that you, that you have those sort of consulting services where, you, where in fact, our mother company is SDD, that's the company who's making producing right. these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. As AMR, we are a distributor, distributor of right, 3D okay, printing. Uh, but yeah. SDD, they, they offer those sort of design services that people can come to them and say, Hey, we have this thing, it is broken, we either can't get the part anymore, or the part that we get is too expensive. What can you do? And they well, can work they, with they those only, engineers. Well, they only do it for the, the five uh, big companies they, they are who are their customer. Right. A, uh, uh, Ose, Canon, HP, Konica, Minolta. Okay, cool. Yeah. Brilliant. So let's take a look at some of the more consumer grade machines. And I'm using that word lightly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when we look yeah. at the other desktop machines they've got. Okay, so then we are talking more about, um, we're getting into prosumer, still mass manufacturing. Um, and we're dealing with, with the other Cubicons that we have here. So we have the, the big brother, the, the, the middle sister, and the, uh, and the baby brother over there. Um, and, and what we're dealing with is, so, so okay, so let, let's talk this machine to begin with, because I think it's probably the most interesting one. So let's, so build volume is? What? 310 by 310 by 310. Okay, cool. So pretty, yep. a, a large build volume a by large most standards. Yep. Um, we've got material housed on the outside, filament runout sensors, it's direct drive. Um, we're doing about 150 odd millimeters a second. And again, when we're talking about commercial machines, repeatability, reliability. That's the name of the game, right? This is about making sure that every time I put this part on, it's dimensionally accurate, it's dimensionally consistent, and I get the same quality every single time yep. I do it. So talk to me about what makes this machine special in the market. It, it makes it special due to the fact, okay, it's, it's hot. Of course, it, it, <laughs> it has an enclosure, uh, a large building platform, a built in a triple filter, and you can remove the part easily after printing without any tools. Okay, cool. So it's, all, yeah. so it's got the same triple filter on that we've got yeah, on the exactly, on the large one. machine. Yeah. Um, as I say, it's, I mean, ferrets gold, and I like it. Um, so, I mean, a very impressive looking machine. So we've got removable build plates as well, so it's nice and easy to take out and go. Auto leveling and Of course, auto leveling, of, camera inside, so, so you it can... So it is just click and forget. And yep. then this is also scalable to a farm with, this, with, with, this, with your software so that you can... Are you doing proprietary slices? So, um, so open source slices. Yep. What do you have regarding farm software? So if you're connecting multiples of these machines or are you just doing it all from, all from the slices that are available now? Yeah, we do it all from the slices which are available now. So we do it in our company. We yep. have 32 of these printers uh, on a daily basis printing thousands. Which is, which is what's producing a lot of the parts we talked about earlier, doing exactly. that at the farm level. We're printing, I think, 400 kilo filament a month. Brilliant. Yep. Well, thanks very much for making the time. Yep. We'll catch you on the next booth.